Hello, podcast listeners of Lawfully Creative. Today we are spending an hour with Scott Horton, who is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Investors Limited, based in London, a company which is at the center of the venture capital and seed investing community in the UK and in particular in London. So have a great listen to um, what Scott's got to say about this uh, particular um, booming sector of the UK economy. And I'll um, be back in touch with you at the end of this uh, podcast. I looked at your uh, profile online, as in particular on, on LinkedIn, and noticed that you were heavily in Wales uh, at the beginning of your life. You, were you born there? No, so I, I'm originally from Hertfordshire, which is just obviously north of London, about 20 miles north of London, but I went to Wales for university. So okay. I, was, uh, I studied at the University College of Wales in Aberystwyth, which is a beautiful part of the world. Yeah. And then I stayed on in Aberystwyth and I did a, um, an MBA there. So, um, for, so I was there for four years. Yes, that's, that's, that's what I read. And so Hartford is in Hertfordshire for the high Hartford school. Hartford is in and Hertfordshire. Yes, yeah, so correct. I'm not very good with English <laughs> geography because I'm in British. Because you're French, exactly. Yeah. I'm French, but when I'm in the UK, I'm mostly in London. However, I like going to Way on, uh, way on High. Hey on Why. Hey on Why. Which is actually, Indeed, which sorry. is actually very close to Wales. Uh, well, it's in Wales. It's, well, it's in the border, I think. So part of it might be. Really? What, I think it's the. the I think it's England, of, of with England and Wales. Well, you have to go after um, uh, Hereford. Yeah. Which I believe is in Wales. And no, then, Hereford isn't in Wales. It's in. It's in England. Okay, fine. <laughs> and then, and then you have to take a bus, which brings you to Hay on Wye. Yeah. Uh, it last um, weekend was actually. You can drive to Hay on Wye as well. I did. <laughs> But it really just messed my my back, so I never did it again. Because right. I usually go every July for the for the festival, festival. Hey, yeah, hey on wine festival. I love Indeed. going to yeah, the very nice. festival. Yeah. And also they had uh, they have every winter a winter uh, weekend, which was last weekend. But I didn't manage to go this year. So uh, fantastic. The jacket is actually coming from uh, the Hay on the Y uh, really? main shop. So is this the jacket that your your listeners can't see? Exactly, but uh, <laughs> but it, it looks very nice. It's Welsh uh, tweed. So I love I love <laughs> Wales. So okay, so how is it actually? Is it is it like a, a pretty good uh, university? It's a fantastic university. Why? It's um well why because Rugby? there are fifty six pubs, <laughs> and there are just as many churches. In Aber, Aber- Aberystwyth, well, I think Aberystwyth. it's actually, it was certainly voted the, the best student life out of okay. all universities, right. and I think it still holds that sort of phenomenal title. But it's um, very good for sports if you spend It's very good for sports, club. very good for sports, very, very, very strong on rugby, as rugby you can imagine, being in Wales. <laughs> but I was a big rugby player and cricketer, and it's it's good for cricket as well. I saw it. These are some of two of your hobbies, actually, watching yeah, yeah. cricket and playing cricket well, and watching rugby. Well, I used to be a very, very big sportsman, and so I used to play cricket uh, a lot. And played. Uh, obviously, my dad's from Yorkshire, so it's in the blood to play cricket. Uh, so I brought up. Was always played cricket all my life, and played to a very strong club standard. I live five minutes far from Lord's Cricket Ground. I'm a member of the MCC. Oh, but so I've never been for a, for a game. Cause I've been well, you're French and probably not allowed. Um, <laughs> and it would true. be too complicated I to explain. I did visit it. I visited it, you know. I yeah, it is beautiful. Visit, but it's beautiful. I never went for a game because I don't think I would uh, stand the whole... Well, it's a five-day test match. Exactly. No, it's not which, for me. Which is very hard for anybody to understand how it can last five days and still end in a draw. So um, I, I won't even try to sort of okay, educate so, that. Yeah. So it was a good experience about Wales. Wales was fantastic, mm. and certainly it, it's a it's a brilliant university. Um, and then I stayed on to do an MBA, so yeah. that got me started in the business sort of world, I suppose. It's interesting you decided to do the MBA straight after ba- your bachelor's degree. Yeah, usually it is. Well, you say usually, but I did my. MBA back in 1987. Seven, correct. So actually, before many people who listen to this podcast were actually um, obviously uh, conceived, that sort of thing, I would imagine. But so the MBA was actually quite a new uh, qualification in those times. I mean, okay. with with hindsight, certainly I would recommend 
people to do go and do a couple of years in industry and then do the MBA. But at the time, it was a it was a new qualification for the university, so I decided to stay on. I, and did, I, I did a rather similar thing than you in the sense that I finished my ma- for me it was a master's degree actually mm. uh, uh, in France, and then I went straight to Bocconi um, Business School to do a oh. master's degree in finance and economics. I yeah. graduated first in, in law, business law, yeah. then finance and economics. But when I was there at, at the master's degree for MEM, it was called at the time from Sda Bocconi, I noticed that most of my fellow uh, students who had actually already had, uh, five, three or four yeah. years of experience under yeah. the belt, so I was like, okay. Yeah. It was a challenging year. For it me. is, yeah, no. I mean, with hindsight, it's better to do, you know, do, do some time in, in, in the commercial world and then, and then yeah. do MBA. But as I say, but back then, the, it was a new course. And in fairness, it, it stood me in good stead because I, I went on from that and then joined the graduate uh, training scheme at Mars Confectionery. So probably one of the best graduate schemes, you know, in the UK. Wonderful. But what about your experience in 86, 87, where you were contractor ah, so, for Milk Marketing oh, Board? Oh, you, you have done your homework. So, uh-huh. basically, as part of my MBA, ah. I had to work for a company cool. at the same time. So, I worked for the Milk Marketing Board, um, and I worked... Then, actually, it was all about two projects. One was uh, exporting from England and Wales to Italy. So looking milk. at milk, well, products. milk and other products and, and dairy products. And the other okay. one was the launch of real ice cream because back oh. then ice cream was just, was, 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 wasn't was exactly, uh, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't the ice cream that we have now, the dairy ice cream. It was it was more sort of with preservatives and all sorts of things. So they were looking at that point in time. What, you mean in the UK? In the UK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Looking to bring in a higher quality of... You, you needed know, more of, Italians. More exactly. Italians bring some exactly. proper ice cream. Probably, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, so, yeah, indeed, I saw that you really had, like, a, 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 um, a um, an extensive uh, experience in the food manufacturing industry as a sales person yeah. or as a marketing person. Correct. Starting as I was... Yeah, so, so, so basically... Uh, and then on, on boarding And on then Mars, Mars Confectionery. That, yeah, so I was at Mars for, what I think, that, about five years. So that's 1988 to 92, four years, um, and I started off in, you know, basically part of the graduate training scheme, but I, I was in um, um, sales, so, you know, earned my sort of spurs, as it were, in, in, in sales. So this was territory sales, I was responsible for various sort of sales territories, certain customers like CTNs um, and then impulse retailers. And then I sort of moved into new trade channels. So I was responsible for getting confectionery into Wembley Stadium. And this is actually quite interesting because if you think of it, you think, well, why on earth wasn't Wembley Stadium stocking confectionery before? But the, the interesting thing is, is well, that... For supporters, right? For supporters. Yeah. But it's, it's all about... It's cold out there when you... Well, it's not only really cold, but it's sort of, it, you know, it, it, when you think about something like a trade channel, like, like as, as a stadium, there's only a certain period of time that peop- the, the supporters can purchase items. So mm-hmm. obviously they would gladly buy Mars bars, yeah. you, know, you know, before a game sure. in the interval. But obviously the stadium wanted to maximise that amount of spend and that time. So that so they weren't actually keen on stocking Mars bars because it meant if somebody was spending at that point in time uh, 50 pence on a Mars bar, they wouldn't be spending three pounds on a burger. So basically it yes. was really understanding those interesting points about uh, 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 that retail channel and was able to turn that round and actually introduce sharing confectionery. So large Maltesers, Maltesers, M and M's, and so on. So actually, vending machines. Then? They weren't in vending machines. Vending. They they were in the very small kiosks. Oh, okay. And also, what's interesting, it was things like the how you actually paid because in those days you paid cash. Right. So, you know, things had to be certain price points, mm. and that those price points couldn't be then easily compared with the retail market the normal retail market outside. So we, we produce we ended up producing special large ah, containers of of Maltesers and M&Ms okay. to sell into those sorts of outlets. So it was a really interesting place to cut your teeth in sales really. Sure. 
And also to adapt your offer to the, the needs of a, of this particular. It was market. all about listening to the to the to the you know to the customer there, yeah. listening to the needs they, of the buyer. Were they already doing the mega concerts that they now? They were doing yeah, they were doing massive really? concerts yeah. Yeah, yeah they were at doing, the yeah. time yes, yeah. Of yeah. already. Yeah. Okay, so and and then you actually just also out of that, that, another really interesting claim to fame is yeah. I was involved in the the launch of uh, Mars ice cream, and that wow. actually transformed the ice cream landscape in the UK as we did it because before that point there were choc ices which weren't proper chocolate and they weren't proper ice cream and then Mars came along with a premium you know ice cream uh, chocolate and it just revolution revolutionized the ice cream market so oh, that's that my claim to fame that was in that was in that, that was about 1990 I should imagine right, yeah. yeah and the, the ice cream market was still very much oh yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was it well it obviously was ice cream but it was a, they were called choc ices for a very good reason because they weren't oh. they weren't chocolate they weren't proper ice cream oh, okay and um how is it working out of slow? Um, or do you say slough for slow? Because it doesn't uh, sound really, really yeah. It doesn't sound really exotic. But no, like, well, it's well, not. You're on the move a lot. It's not exotic. So yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, that, I mean, I mean, those days I was I was working from home uh, because I worked. Slough. I managed managed territories. So my first territory was northeast London, and then I okay. then in places in East Anglia and all sorts of places. So but you didn't have to be based in slough. No, you you went to the office maybe. You, Twice, uh, twice a month, something like that. I wow, suppose. good on Mars to already yeah. be doing some sort of hot, hot yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like but it was field time. sales, so you know you were, you were expected not to, you know, be out in the field I on, see, on the road, as, as it were. Rob, I mean, my office was my car <laughs> back in those days. <laughs> um, and then you moved on to uh, another uh, uh, big food manufacturing company, and specialised also in consumer foods product, which at the time was called. Rank Hovis McDougall. Rank Hovis McDougall. So I just I, I, I recognise Hovis because yeah. of the bread thing, the sliced yeah. bread, the sliced bread, which I see in my te- local yeah. Tesco. But uh, apparently they don't only do flour. No, products. they do they do many. It's a very British company. Okay. So basically, products like Paxo stuffing and sacks of salt and Bisto gravy. And uh, I think they did Robertson's jams back then. Oh. So a whole host of sort of uh, a Torah um, um, oh, suet <laughs> sort of products. L- lots Sorry, of what was it, a Torah? A, a Torah um, suet. So it's actually it's brand. It's it's it, well it's, it, it, it's it's what you make suet puddings from. Uh, it's a meat based product that you put into baking and so on dumplings being cake. French you've probably you've never had the, the delights of a suet pudding <laughs> probably not um, okay and I, I was wondering what attracted you to this uh, food consumer sector um, I don't know I think I think, I think in those days I mean it's really interesting to sort of compare you, you know the 80s as it were to perhaps you know graduates going into work uh, now, because because back in the eighties, you know there weren't startups; it didn't exist. You know the the career progression, the the advice you always received at, at university careers was, why don't you become an accountant? Uh, and of course, nobody wanted to become an accountant. Um, and so then there were obviously what was called the milk round. So lots of big corporates would come and to each university and you know try to attract graduates. And then of course the reality was that. You know what all graduates wanted was to get onto a graduate training scheme, and I was, you know, very oh, pleased a for a multinational. Uh, I mean, the aspiration was never to sort of get involved into entrepreneurship. It was really to join multinationals to get very well, you know, trained. I mean, I mean, it seems very strange now because I see many, many young graduates who have no aspiration whatsoever to join multinationals. But there was also, uh, like around 10, 10, 15 years after you, there was another trend, which is Generation X, which is my, my generation, where actually graduates wanted to find positions in banks and in, in finance companies and yes. working on the stock market, etc. And that's what happened to yeah. me because I got yeah. recruited. Like yeah. Dressner, Klein, and yeah. Benson yeah. were on on campus at Stabokoni oh, when wow. they were doing all their yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, and so that was supposed to be the uh, uh, the golden route back then. Yeah. So I've I've put on hold my uh, lawyer program, like my oh, lawyer, okay, well. yeah, becoming a yeah. fully qualified lawyer and yeah. stuff. And instead, I went working 
in the city of London two, two or three years as an M&A analyst. Oh, wow. Um, okay, so thanks for explaining the context, which... Yeah, I mean, it's... In, it, your, in, in your time, after, after uh, um, university for you, it was like the great, the, great, the, yeah. the, the golden route, like the... Yeah, the, pretty the, much, the, yeah. La Voie Royale, as we say, yeah. the royal route. Yeah. And now you're right, I think that um, it's really not attractive. Gra- graduates are not interested in, in joining mega mm. <laughs> multinationals. And which I think is a shame, by the way. They I mean, want I, to I, be yeah. uh, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Greta Thunberg, God. God, God help us, yeah, but anyway, yeah. Um, right, and, um, and you, you, you did have a, a brief stint in consumer healthcare. Uh, no, okay, so, so basically, so I was at um, Rank Hovis, Hovis, Rank Hovis at McDougall for, I can't remember how many years, but, but a number of years, probably. Three. Uh, was it three or four years, something like yeah, that? I, I come, but basically, then I, I then, um, you know, so, so I was moving up the, the sales, you know, ladder, as it were, hierarchy. So I went from sort of territory sales into sort of sales management and then into basically national sales management and, and major account management. So I joined um, then SmithKline Beecham as a national account sales manager and that was the sort of products there initially I was responsible for were LucasAid and Ribena and Horlix um, and my accounts were so f- sort of uh, not food products but beverages. well drinks beverages. you know I mean I mean drinks yeah okay. so so, so um, soft drinks and okay. then Horlix not obviously. drugs not drugs mm-hmm. not, but it obviously it was part of the consumer health group I mean they did have at the time Aquafresh toothpaste and Panadol and, and you know other over-the-counter medicines but they had a, a, a drinks um, uh, division, division as, as well so that's the sort of more logical area that I slotted into and then and then I actually then got promoted into the broader group as a um, basically a, a channel manager so I had a team of national account managers reporting into me and so then I had the, the the wonders of you know products like the toothpaste and the the <laughs> paracetamols and the smoking cessation whatever so certainly not fast moving consumer goods but but still consumer goods basically yeah, yeah. um great and uh, i mean you know I, I, I for me it's um even if it's not sexy as long as it sells it and it's a cash cow because everybody will ever uh, we always need some toothpaste i think this is this is, yeah. this is a great yeah, this is a great good uh, a great um uh, option as well yeah especially yeah in the 1990s 2000 i mean it, the we did we know was that not sector where everyone was in recession or something I, anyway i don't know uh, i think, I think I, I, sometimes when the t- uh, yeah. time yeah times are Hard. It's it's good to work uh, yeah. for cash cow products. Yeah. And then, so when did you start working in the startup scene so, and VC space? Okay. So, so so basically, I was in that big multinational kind of FMCG world for about um, fifteen years. Yeah. I guess all, always along that journey, I was always a bit of a frustrated entrepreneur. Um, certainly, really enjoyed my time at the likes of Mars Confectionery. You know, absolutely fantastic company. Is it? Is it? Isn't it American? Well, it's um, it's the, the the Mars Brothers are American, uh, but they is obviously Swiss? S- no, there's no Swiss angle to it. No. Okay. Sorry. So it's it's, sorry. it's it's kind of American. It's it's, it's 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 a family-owned business, so I guess you could say it's it is American sort of owned, really. Oh. But it was it was started. You know, obviously it was launched into the UK in about the 1930s, I believe. Oh. Um, but you know, I'm you know met the Mars Brothers. I mean, two incredible people, really, sort of thing. Wow. Uh, I, wish I don't know if they're still alive. I don't oh, think they are now. But um, anyway, so having been in that world for about 15 years, a little yes. bit of a frustrated entrepreneur, um, I was then caught up in the merger between SmithKline and GlaxoSmithKline, yeah. um, which then put everybody's careers on hold for about two years because there was a merger that took place, and then there was a sorting out of you know amalgamations and, and, and effectively everybody's careers got put on hold and at that, cleaning. yeah and at that point I'd been in my 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 role then about four years and like and like all you know anybody you, you, you get frustrated if you're just after four years you want to be doing something else and I always remember it's a very very interesting story but some bright spark in the marketing department thought well what the company needs to cheer everybody up is trying to bring a little bit more sort of 
innovation and sort of uh, enthusiasm into the company. So okay. they started organising a number of sort of outside speakers to come in. Oh. And one of the outside speakers events that I attended was the um, a guy called Simon Woodruff, who was the founder of Yo Sushi. Okay. Now you'll remember he became one of the dragons, the, one of the original dragons and all these sorts of things. But anyway, he then told his story about how he founded Yo Sushi. And it's actually quite interesting because... He started off life as I a. I like them. I don't know if they exist yet. Well, it's, it's they still they still exist. They still exist. I don't I don't know, I, yeah I don't know if they and, and they, they yeah well. and they were basically the obviously it was obviously a conveyor belt yeah. sushi restaurant. Yeah. They were the first in the UK. So how did that come about? Well, he was a roadie in the music industry and he was in Japan and he was right. in a sushi restaurant with conveyor belts and he thought, oh, this is pretty cool. And then he thought, how can how on earth could you know I start one of these up in the UK? And he went on the internet back then or whatever and found you know a, a guide how to start your own conveyor belt sushi restaurant and then he just told his story about how he founded this startup and it was a, basically loads of blagging and loads of great tips for any startup so one of the things he said was that he 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 wrote off to um yamaha i believe and said to yamaha i'm starting a chain of restaurants and could i basically hire or could I look look to purchase some of your little mopeds because we're going to use them to drive around the, the the sushi and of course Yamaha thought well that's fine okay well you can use them for a weekend or something what do you mean it will drive around the sushi well you, you know for just to get people who ordered sushi to to get delivery at home and these sorts of things ah oh, right in anyway, the streets not in the shop okay. yeah yeah so obviously Yamaha you know thought nothing of it you know here's a few bikes for the weekend but then, interestingly, he wrote off to all Nippon Airways and said, Yo Sushi, sponsored by Yamaha, we'd be looking for, would you be interested in sponsoring, you know, our new sort of Japanese-themed restaurant in, in the UK? That's and I think nice. all Nippon Airways said, well, if Yamaha are involved, we'll gladly sponsor you, sort of thing. And it was basically a story for about an hour and a half of all these sorts of wonderful anecdotes. What did he mean by sponsoring? Like investing in the pay. business? In pe investing, okay. paying, marketing, promotions, right. all sorts oh, of things. Really? Mm -hmm. And coming out of this then meeting, the whole idea was to put more innovation into the sales and marketing teams. But, but all it really spurred on was that all those people that were on the cusp of thinking, I've had enough of the big corporate world, I'd like to start my own company literally just handed in their notices the next week. So, really? so I then handed in my... There, there, was an opportunity, like, there, there was an opportunity at the time to take a, a, you know, a good redundancy that scheme. That sounds like a bit, a bit impulsive, though. It was very impulsive. A bit of a but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, but it was because, basically, the whole, as I mentioned, the whole, everyone's careers were on hold for a couple of yeah. years. Um, there were options of you know, good redundancy packages if you wanted to you know, not okay. hang around. So basically, I was, I'd was i been in that world for 15 years. I'd always been a did frustrated you take entrepreneur. Did you take I, I, took, I took a nice redundancy package, and then I looked to start up my own um, Café Jouet proposition, really, yeah, which, I which I knew nothing about at the I time. Was about to, I was about to ask. Uh, right, that was pretty ballsy. Excuse my French. And so Café Jouet, because I didn't find any information on... on yeah, so... So what, what was the... What was, the, was that a, a restaurant? Yeah, so let me, let me kind of explain. So, two years? So at the time, um, I had two very small children. They were probably... I was about to say, what did his wife say? They were... They were going to take a package. Yeah, they, was, they, well, they, were, they were about three and four, I think, <laughs> at the time. Um, uh, my, 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 my wife works for... TK Maxx, uh, you know, wonderful retailer. So she she was a full time job as well. So anyway, yeah. I so I, I took a nice so redundant. Yeah, I had your best. Yeah, I had a I had a nice cushion of yeah. you know a, yeah. a, 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 a reasonable amount of time. So I uh, we as a you know as a, uh, we were spending a lot of time in basically we always lived in London since university, um, and we took the small children, our small children, to these indoor play concepts, and the idea is that. Many people have got who have got kids out there. What, like a kindergarten? Well, they're they're more than that. So this is a sort of at a weekend and a birthday party type of thing. And uh -huh. basically, they're typically like warehouses that the kids love because there's slides and ball pits and climbing apparatus and wonderful sort of things that they can go and immerse themselves in. Right. And then basically, at the time in the market, there was then nothing for the parents other than really poor quality plastic chairs. 
and, ter- yeah, and terrible, and terrible coffee. So my <laughs> concept, you know, having you know attended these places many, many times and seen the you know the real well, where joy. Where are they? Are they in the centre of London? Well, so this this was this was what the opportunity was because basically I was going to these places that were in you know grotty warehouses you know, in <laughs> so London. And, but yeah, but looking round, you could see there was a, an accountancy partner. There was a legal partner. There was among the parents. Yeah, you know, exactly. There was very, we very we wealthy people, people but funds. literally cringing on the plastic chairs. You bet. So my concept, Cafe Jouet, was basically to to do exactly the same, but obviously more for the parents. So more of a paradise for parents. So it was an upmarket indoor play concept. Now I knew nothing about writing a business plan. I knew nothing about raising finance. I knew nothing about starting a business. So I then embarked upon that whole journey with that concept in mind. And then about, I suppose, 18 months later, I'd secured £750,000 of investment. I got basically, back in those days, you could get a small firm's loan. So there was a £150,000 unsecured loan. I got private investors and I got VC investment. But what became interesting was that... But hell, this adventure went on for two years, so... Well, no, let me... So, so, so the, the process lasted probably about 18 months. Okay. Uh, the reality was, unfortunately, my, my claim to fame is that I successfully raised three quarters million pounds, okay. but I returned the money. Because, oh, because the property became the, the greatest issue. And of this course. is... It's very expensive. Well, it's not only expensive, but for a startup with, with no, um, no track record yeah. in, in the industry... Uh, and no sort of credentials, it, I thought it would just be a case of, uh, well, I've got the money, here's the money in the bank, I can pay your rent. Yeah. But obviously, if you're a landlord, you'd prefer to have a tenant like Pizza Express, mm-hmm. who's been in business many, many years and has a strong covenant, rather than any other, you know, startup company without any, any sort of covenant. And it was a, that was very interesting, learning about the, the, the commercial property market. Because so were you not able to secure a, well, uh, a lease? I, I secured on, many, on poten- many potential properties, but what became interesting is once you then had multiple shareholders in terms of, I had a VC involved, I had a lead private investor, mm-hmm. everybody had their say. And the reality is I had um, six months to secure the first premises. And we couldn't agree on the right premises. And we were looking for mm-hmm. premises across London, but in very affluent areas. So things like sure. Richmond, you know, Highgate, Hampstead. You know, I mean, I mean, the list is endless of the of the sort of the types of places. But it had to be, it had to be a property with with leisure consent, which was hard to get. Property with nearby parking, mm-hmm. which is hard to get. Mm-hmm. Property with eighteen foot height, which is which is hard to get. Uh, and about. 8,000 8, square um, feet in space as well. So the actual property side of things became a lot harder to achieve than the money. And I always thought raising the money would be the hardest thing. That's quite really interesting because it shows that um, as a startup, perhaps you want to focus on gathering and developing your intangible assets rather than having uh, Brick and mortar assets and uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, like uh, yeah. tangible assets. So that's that's what yeah, and, and and it wasn't like it was obviously talking about purchasing. Were you, were you able to wipe wipe the uh, the, the, the slate clean in terms of like returning the money? Yeah, yeah. So so, not so to file for yeah, no, no, like that, oh, no. So, so yeah, so, so essentially, I, I I never drew drew down the money. Okay, good, good. But one of my Oof, one of my obviously co-founders uh, of investors was. Uh, Oliver Woolley uh, yep. actually was one of my advisors to part of the, the capital. And Oliver and I, I mean, he gave me the idea. He said, look, if, if, if you don't successfully launch this business, you know, you and I now know more about starting businesses than the advice we'd ever received about raising finance. I mean, I had such poor quality advice about how to raise finance. It was only really when, when I met Oliver, yeah. who had been, you know, an entrepreneur who'd started up his own business and successfully exited his business. So his advice was very, very pertinent about raising equity finance. And then my advice, you know, having raised equity finance myself, we then realised that together we could bring to the market a very strong proposition, which was all about helping other early stage companies successfully raise equity finance. So the Café Jouet experience was a great way... It was a great way... network of strong... uh, 
potential colleagues and advisors in well Vita and also started. it was it, i had to go yes. through that journey of starting up a business successfully securing finance mm. doing doing the whole thing for 18 months to give me the credentials to help advise other companies i mean i, I learned more in those 18 months than i did in the last 15 years of working at big corporates oliver woolley actually incorporated investors london limited in uh, april 2010 and you became a director of a business in May 2010. Yeah, so we, we yeah, so we, we actually founded the business in two th August 2004 as a consultancy. Was, so it was it was ah, Investors it was LLP. I see. So we started off. There were four sort of, of us questions. that found the, the four original founders, um, and we ran it as a consultancy, yeah. as a li limited liability partnership, uh -huh. um, and then in 2010. We, be, we, we switched to become a, a limited company. We actually sold the business in 2010 to uh, an AIM-listed uh, fund manager. How? Which of a consultancy business from the LLP? Well, we sold Investors Limited to an AIM-listed fund, fund manager. And then actually, for about two years, we were part of, which is the Braveheart Investment Group. Okay. Uh, PLC okay. and then um, basically uh, about two years later we decided to take the business independent again so we, we kind of extricated ourselves from that sale so you as well. did a sort of management buy, buy we did, yeah we did a sale then a sort of a buyout basically yeah, yeah. okay well I okay interesting and, and so, so you've, been, you've been at investors for almost 20 years next year yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Birthday, <laughs> 20 years anniversary exactly anniversary Exactly. Coming through. Exactly. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. and so um, so this is where you were able to leverage of his experience for Cafe Jouet in order to become a uh, a, a full time advisor to yeah. entrepreneurs and yeah. startups yeah. yes. who who wanted to. So, what's the concept of investors in a nutshell? Yeah, so we started off life as a um, essentially a corporate finance advisory firm. We became regulated by the FSA back in 2005 and then obviously became the FCA. Mm -hmm. We built up our own private investor network and essentially our, our, you know, uh, our whole reason to exist was to help high growth early stage companies raise equity finance. From our network of investors, and we've, we've raised over 150 million for about 500 odd companies, mm -hmm. and we've had what since since 2010 si or? Si since since 2005 basically, since and we've had about 26 very successful exits along the way. Can you name some? Uh, the biggest exit is in terms of probably managers, it was a company called Charge Master. Okay. So they were electric vehicle recharging. They were one of the early pioneers into this market. We raised a total of um, 15 million pounds of equity into that business from, for, from about um, 50 of our investors. And that business was sold to BP for about 130 million in about 2018. So that returned net profit to the investors of about um, 50 million. So that was a nice return. One of our other great catching, ka one of but the probably uh, the greater return, not monetary but uh, uh, multiples, was there's a company called Parking Eye, and they were automatic number plate recognition. Okay. We introduced the sort of seed capital of about two hundred and fifty thousand. That was then sold to Capita for um, fifty million, and the investors that put in fifty thousand, two hundred fifty thousand, made seventy seven times their money, which is quite astronomical right nice to nice to have yeah so I mean yes those are the successes I suppose that there was mm. quite a lot of uh, startups trying yeah. to not succeed but but um, all in all do you do you think that this is a business which is which has a bright future ahead of well it? so 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 that so that okay. was that was the core business that we did obviously for many years in about 2014 we recognized the need to bring in Technology to connect our investor base with mm -hmm. our, you know, screened uh, client companies. Okay. We couldn't find that technology, so we decided to build it ourselves. And right at the start of creating our own investment platform, yep. we incorporated the opportunity to license that opportunity uh, or license that platform on a white label manner. And for those platforms, then 
if they wanted, the licensee wanted to, could be connected to other platforms. So we're, right from the beginning, we were building a network of networks. So that, is, that, is that under the investors? That's under the umbrella? investry. So the platform's called the investry platform. Okay. Yeah. And obviously investors has its own sort of platform, but then there are many other white label, you know, platforms using using our technology. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I was actually seeing in your in your latest annual returns that you filed last year in March. No, sorry, so earlier this year in March. That um, yes, your uh, proprietary uh, uh, platform yeah. is actually valued. I think at sixty five grand. Uh, put well, we've <laughs> it should be worth more than that. So we we've yeah. invested considerable of valuation 60, around sixty five grand. Yeah. Yes, yeah. internally generated software development costs. Well, just for the year. That's just, just for the just year. That, that's just for this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean we we've we've we've, we've invested sort of multiple millions of pounds right. in, in, the in, in was, into the platform, yeah. and and at that point really once we once we started going down the route of creating software and licensing software, I guess we pivoted to become a um, fintech company ourselves. I see. But is it, is it successful, the licensing? Yeah, no, it, it's successful. It's successful. And I guess what, what, what that's moved on to, and this really then happened in 2019, is we then got involved with the uh, startup and innovator visas categories, and we became appointed by the Home Office as a yes. dorsa for those... That for those visa categories. So essentially we were assessing overseas nationals really? who wanted to bring innovative companies to the UK. We would, ass we would ass assess, validate, and, and endorse those businesses and then mentor those businesses right. and land those businesses into the UK. And so you had like direct contact, you had yeah. direct contact with the Home Office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So to, it, to, to facilitate the yeah. granting of visas? So, yeah, so visas. start up and innovative visas and then wow. What became interesting is Did you that, still do this? Well, what became interesting is that we were then one of 45 companies that had that accreditation. Mm -hmm. The Home Office realised that that was far too unwieldy, having that many sort of numbers. And they, and they then went oh. to a tender process of wanting to just appoint three okay. companies. And we went through the tender exercise and we were appointed as one of the... Oh, good. Um, uh, one of the organisations that has the contract with the Home Office for what's called now the Innovator. Three out of visa. forty-five. Three out of forty-five. That's and interestingly, so you are, are you still doing it? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this started. This started in April, twenty-three, um, and so any innovator, any anybody wanting to start an innovative business under the Innovator route, you know, has to go through one of the endorsers, and there are only three, and, and the, we're one of ours. Well, and who are the two others? Okay. The other two are a company called um, uh, Innovator International, and then there's a consortium called UKES, UKES. Wow. Um, I'm not surprised, the Home Office is pretty tough. Right? Yeah, but what was interesting is the Home Office wanted a cloud-based solution to... Okay for applicants to apply to and for the Home Office to access the data in a secure, confidential way. So our platform was actually approved. It went through the Mercury Security Assessment, which is a six-month painful exercise with the Home Office. Sort of ISO Yeah, sort of all of that kind of stuff assessment. and cyber essentials and things. And so, the, so, the, so our platform is then approved and we've adapted it for... The home office use. So we're now. You must have made your software developers very rich yeah. indeed. That's so we we get about a hundred <laughs> applicants a month, and, oh, wow. and from, it, from which part of the world? They are globally, obviously. Um, I guess the big chunk of them comes from the India, Pakistan, Middle East, China. Is probably the, ma the major. Asia. We've had a couple of French applicants, interestingly. Well, mm -hmm. and you can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure why anybody, you know, but they're all very attracted to come to the UK. Well, London is great. <laughs> yeah. When in my early 20s, I was so glad I would relocate to London. Coming back to the licensing business, yeah. though, um, I was wondering, so you said it was successful. Yeah. Uh, and you, your company was successful as a licensor. Would you please let us know some of the licensees that you guys have? Uh, there's people like of, um, 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 Set Squared. There's what are they? The, well, they're a university sort of spin up so they're one of the they, they, they have a number of the UK universities as sort of an, like an umbrella organization, and they're 
responsible for sort of spinning out technology from universities. And they have a collection of their own investors and they have lots of also these companies and Wonderful. technology and they need, a, they need a way of, you know, essentially matching, you know, their propositions with investors like online. A, a sort of broker, broker place. Yeah, uh, so, so place. it's a secure way, you know, it's not, this is not crowd uh, funding, it's just really a secure way of promoting investment propositions. You know, investors have got to log in, they've got to, you know, be aware of the wealth, things like the, the wealth warnings and the risks. And then obviously all the all the information is held confidential confidentially. So there's there's multiple layers of access and controls and so on, as you can imagine. So that's one of your of your licensees. Yeah, and then there's 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 many others, uh, you know, in okay. the in the similar sort of field, really. And um, so on um, investors.anniversary.com, there's also a section which relates to deals. And yeah. And w- so so interesting now. So some of those, well, actually a lot of them are from our licensees. So we now, as I mentioned, right. a, a licensee can, if they wish, connect to not only our investment platform, but potentially all the other investment platforms that we license. So there's a sharing of, of propositions okay. and then there's a sort of a monetization depending on, you know, success fees can be charged and shared wherever the money is introduced from. So this is the, um, the 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 page which is called deals yeah. is basically a, a, a list of um, of potential investments that yeah one potential could, investments that could, could invest into yeah okay the, I, I see actually that the the, the food the food consumer food businesses are quite uh, prominent with well fruited and uh, okay yeah yeah well that's probably because and what what yeah what we're, look, what we're looking at there is 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 uh, we have many different partners who are licensees and they're sort of specialists in certain areas. Okay. I think that one is probably one of our, from one of our partners who specializes in the food industry is why that's coming okay. up. Okay. Um, okay. And so, so investors, just to make it very tangible for our listeners, mm-hmm. would go on the deals section of your website yeah. and would say, okay, well, today I feel like investing <laughs> through, uh, on, 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 on this particular um, company or startup and uh, and um, let, let's apply is that how it works yeah yeah i mean the reality is i mean obviously most of your listeners will will know about the crowd funding space where you can invest you know as little as 10 pounds online i guess what this is the difference here is our investors and the investors of our licensee partners are all sophisticated high net worth individuals so typically the minimum investment is probably 10,000 pounds yeah with our investor base, it's twenty-five thousand pounds. So the, the the purpose of the the platform is really the the marketing and the access to all of the information. And then, obviously, we would facilitate. We'd recommend, you know, a potential investor to meet the company. You know, to engage in Q and A, which they can they can do online. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and then so typically most investment actually probably then happens offline rather than through the platform but in terms of the formal pledging and the access to all, all the information it's all the online. data it's all held online right. and so these investors they probably do this for tax reasons to lower their so, tax liabilities right? so yeah what you're referring to there is the enterprise investment scheme yeah, yes. which is obviously yes, yes, a fantastic yes, UK tax which break. I think has been rolled over by the um, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in this last yeah, year. Yeah, I mean it's it's probably the best tax break of its yeah. kind in okay. Europe, sort of thing. So right. um, you know, so um, so pretty much all UK, all of our UK companies, mm-hmm. you know, would qualify for EIS and there's SEIS before that, so that's yeah. a level before which okay. which can get so. It's, it's not a reason to invest, but it's a reason to not invest if, if, if the company hasn't secured EIS, really. Because it's obviously a right. tremendous tax break. Exactly. Which we could go on, go on into, but uh, maybe that's for another podcast and another... So your investors um, sort of, I don't know if you can call it clientele, but at least... Um Group, uh, is there a particular profile for them? Or yeah, so like a, uh, yeah, a city yeah. chap. Or yeah, well, or there's a, there's probably four types. So there 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 are the um, um, city uh, um, bankers, boys and girls who have probably got the bonuses and are looking to yeah, have a little bit of play money well, to an extent the and through EIS. Has just been removed this year as well by the, by the, the yeah. government. 
so you know that I mean that I mean in fairness that is a very active source of capital and yeah. has been. Then there's this. I'm probably the, looking for the tax breaks. Those, those guys. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> so, solely looking for tax breaks. Then there are the, um, I guess, the sort of the retired senior executives right. who you know have access to capital. Yeah. This possibly is a little bit again play capital. It's capital they can afford to lose, but it's capital they probably enthuse the most about. They like talking to their mates on the golf course, it, it was, it was enthusing the on you know around the table with friends but also at a dinner I think party. They like to keep a, a foot into the industry, so to yeah. Speak. So yeah. possibly they might become non-execs. Yeah. Uh, they might become advisors. So they're you know that's a really nice investor. Okay. Then there's the sold-out entrepreneurs. Now right. these probably are the. Uh, you know the number one type of investors like to secure uh, because like of James Dyson and stuff. Yeah, because they you know they're proven know how to start, build, and exit a company, yeah. and they just love the cut and thrust, and they like to be you know just actively involved advising. And then I guess there's probably smaller ticket uh, investors that might be looking for jobs. So a little bit more about what? sort of a job. So so they might be saying, okay. well, I'll, well, I'll invest if I can become a non-exec. Sort of thing. So I'll invest well, in your uh, finance. It, it, because non exec is a, is a, is a remunerated function? Uh, well, it can be, sometimes it's not, sort of thing. But, you know, typically there, there might be a lot of, say, ex finance people that might be saying, well, you know, I can see you're weak on the finance area, I'll invest some money, but I'm looking for a, a job at the same time. So, you know. Well, as a finance. As, yeah, as a sort of CFO. Man- manager yeah, of yeah, your company. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't aware of yeah, the both yeah, type yeah. of. Uh, but um, so I guess there, there, you know, the three or four types mm-hmm. of investors. We also have Thank you for family offices, which is which is really good. I mean, family offices, really? you know, there are less in numbers. We've probably got about so eighty that would be of those. Like a fifth, fifth, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, they're much harder to sort of, you know, to nail down. But mm. essentially, fantastic. Source. Are there many family offices in, in the UK? Nowadays, they're probably. I mean, within our network, it's probably about one hundred and fifty something like that, I suppose. So they just manage trust funds for very. Rich it could, well, it could be that very wealthy individuals, yeah. and then they've obviously got people to deploy mm-hmm. their wealth. But but what are we looking uh, at the uh, uh, Russian oligarchs here? Are we looking at the? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's the answer I was expecting. Uh, like uh, old blood, uh, old money, British. Uh, drugs, no, it, 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 again, it, it really does vary. Okay. There could be again sold out entrepreneurs uh, okay. who just employ you know small mm-hmm. team of people to deploy wealth. There could be more established, long established family family wealth. Right. And of course, their appetites, you know, vary. Uh, sometimes they are very enthused by very early stage. But interestingly, do you know that the pension funds, the U.S. pension funds, they have a portion of a uh, uh, asset that they allocate to um, to VC invest, investing, really? which I think okay. is baffling. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, the US. yeah, yeah. Okay, and yeah. lots of universities. Yeah, um, yeah. They have all these funds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, university funds and pension funds. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I don't think that um, yeah. um, a European. Uh, pension funds and, uh, no. <laughs> and the university the funds are that the, risk, the, yeah, yeah. the risk takers. The problem that we've seen in the UK is that the, the, the VCs are no longer about risk. The really? vast majority of them will invest if you've got a million pounds but, of recurring revenue. But there are, there are some startups that fail, something like 90%. Well, I know, but, and this is why the private investors, the business angels investors, are the ones that take the risk. Oh, really? The so early, it is, early yeah, I mean, it is very, very hard for an early stage company to secure VC investment. I mean, the, you'll be offered investment when you don't actually need the, the money because you're then, you know, profitable, basically. What, what's the expression? Family, friends and fools? Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> ex- exactly. <laughs> but you, you, exactly, but, but, you know, these... Well, the bit- what I can tell you is that I've been, uh, I set up my law firm 12 years ago and it was all bootstrapping. Well, that is the best Between way. In Paris and London, Absolutely. you know, working on the business, yeah. my yeah. ass off, and yeah. uh, day in, day out. Yeah. That's all I This yeah. is, that's exactly so the I attitude. I have no shares, yeah. like, I'm like, it's also in control. Um, yeah, but it's tough. I think, like, yeah. 99% of the people would never do this. Well, that's, <laughs> but, hard. But, but you have to <laughs> do most, it. most people. You have to do it, and you have to, I mean, I always tell a story, we had an entrepreneur. No, but there's also another thing that, as I said, I used to be a banking and finance lawyer. Right. And then I turned into a, becoming an advisor for the creative industry. So I had to completely 
develop the network of, of clients yeah. from scratch, right? So at the beginning, I was yeah. like attending all, uh, yeah. all, all, the, all the basic the trade shows in all yeah. the music industry, film industry. I'm still doing that, of course, post-COVID. But um, it was a matter of life and death to actually develop yeah. a network. No, it is. And you, and you have to, you know, it's this, you know, sort of sweat equity and so on. So, yeah. So yeah. after 19 years developing uh, uh, Investors Limited yeah. to its full potential through yeah. the... Um, Corporate finance advisory. Yeah. The, uh, well, uh, the not necessarily the full potential. We've still got a long way to go. <laughs> uh, I was about to say, and now you mentioned. Sorry, there was something you well, mentioned. Well, so the, uh, so 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 we now we've secured this contract with the Home Office. Which that's is a, right. Yes. The know, visas. So yeah. What what's 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 the next? I mean, firstly, are you happy with your, what you've achieved? Yeah. I saw that Simon Woolley, Woolley has actually just sort of withdrew from the business. Is he is he still involved or is no? He Oliver just... Oliver Woolley is still very much involved. Sorry, Oliver. Yes. Oliver is still very much is involved as okay. um, so so Oliver and I you know uh, are the two founders that are still involved yes. Oliver's CEO and I'm COO oh, sort of gorgeous. thing um, no Oliver's still very much in, involved okay. I mean we're now looking I guess we you know we've been doing this a long time um, we are looking to really to build upon the fact that uh, you know our biggest I think um, feather in the cap is the is securing the home office contract for our with use, utilize what, our what platform. What did you say? The feather in the cap. Feather in the cap. It's a lovely expression. Uh, Very British I'm, expression. I'll go to sleep much, much much more intelligent tonight. <laughs> feather in the cap. Feather in the cap. Is, is it because because of a t- well, obvious? Well, um, I, I mean to build. Process? Yeah, I mean the, the tender process was a thousand pages. I mean it was it was like we were tendering to build a warship. Goodness. Um, and you know, and quite rightly so, really. And we, you know, completely threw ourselves into it and secured it. But it, but it was more the fact that um, we're wow. so pleased that our platform has been, you know, Home Office approved, approved and went through what's called Mercury Security Assessment, yes. which is six months of complete pain, <laughs> but you know, for the right reasons. And I think we're looking, we're looking for gl- other global markets to take a lead from Britain in that. You know, so um, we're looking to sort of globalize our services and s- software offerings. So you want to do some sort of scaling up? Yeah. Lovely. And so you still get excited? I'm by, very excited. By, very, by, by, you know, yeah. uh, and, um, interacting with your team, with all your... Yeah, we have a fantastic team, a lot of, you know, young graduates. And we're delighted that going back to my time of... You know, my path was on the multinational career. I mean, I'm thrilled to they're pieces that investment managers. Your team uh, yeah, members, they're called. Uh, they start off as investment executives and then okay. investment managers, but you know, we we have a number of two or three out of uh, Oxford and Cambridge and good. other good quality universities. Hopefully, we'll get one out of Aberystwyth again soon. Uh, but um, so no, we've got a great do, team. What do they work in tell as investment managers exactly? So um, we have a, a, a growing team that's responsible for the visa side of the, of the company. Okay. So essentially, they are they are assessing innovator visa applications. So assessing against the criteria of is this business innovative, viable, these and scalable. Guys from India, Pakistan, China, yeah. and some, yeah. some from yeah. the two, And then two going from through <laughs> two from France. Uh, so going through the whole, you know, it's a sort of four week kind of screening process. And then if those businesses are then, uh, if they secure visas, if we issue endorsement, they secure visas, we then have a duty to monitor and to report on those businesses. And then also we can provide ancillary sort of an optional uh, advice, guidance, mentoring. So, okay. the, so the team are very much account managing applications through to grant a visa yeah. and then basically through to establishing the business in the UK. Okay. We have um, 50 service partners who we can introduce businesses to. to so that's banks, accountants, lawyers, a uh, whole host of organisations, we, we including yourselves. Yeah, we joined that, yeah. we, we're summer. delighted to have Thanks you on board. Michael, yeah. yes, thank you. Um, although at the moment I haven't, uh, <laughs> I haven't worked. Too busy podcasting. <laughs> uh, no, actually, um, I was contacted by one of your investment managers, Joel. Joel, yeah. Uh, senior investment manager, but yeah. um, the lady was uh, from Nigeria. Was not so interested in uh, spending money on finding a patent. So uh, oh, right. Her choice. Okay. Um, okay, and so what, for example, does um, Michael do as a deal origination lead? Yeah, so so Mike is 
is responsible. He's he, very nice, actually. Yeah. yeah like, so he's so he's actually sort of wearing two hats. So he's still responsible for, you know, this was perhaps the older part of the business, which is companies coming to us looking solely just to raise equity finance. Right. So we'll still we'll still take on some of those companies. But also he's he he's now involved in growing our service partners. So it, yeah. he's sort of basically head of partnerships. Yeah, I, he said he was very involved as well in, in, in developing the uh, proprietary platform. Yeah, the platform, yeah. selling the platform and also then building the, the community and we have a, a, an additional community platform for all of our entrepreneurs. How's that going? That's going great guns. Yeah. I mean, we, we as I say, we, we, we have about 50 odd clients, new, Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's a hundred, about a, between eighty and a hundred each month, and then our track record at the moment is probably been able to issue endorsement for between forty percent of those, I suppose. So, so sorry, so what does it mean? In, so where is it, for example, on the website that you can see? This? Well, you this so so I'm talking about the visa um, okay. endorsement. So we do I have see, a we have a separate visa endorsement okay. platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the platform you're looking at there is our sort of standard sort of if you're a UK company looking to. So that's investors .com. Yeah. So if you're a UK company looking to raise equity finance, you can come onto our platform. And which then. one is the other one for the visa? The other is visa endorsement uh, investors. Investors. Mm, not, not, yeah, yeah. The investors visa endorsement. Well, investors hyphen so visa hyphen endorsement dot co uk. Sorry. So this is the platform. This is where you're seeing the growth. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 this is what this is this is what the home office utilise. They okay. all they all have access. And this is if you're an innovative, you know, entrepreneur looking to, you know, come to the UK under the innovative awesome. visa awesome. and also if you're a scale up or a potential scale up in the UK and you want to employ overseas nationals we have the we have the right to oh, yes. assess your business endorse your business and that means your business can employ overseas nationals so oh, yeah. and this is where the French blokes have to do that because with Brexit now they have to apply exactly the home office. yeah so Gosh. that's what any, any European who yeah. wasn't here before any you know before Brexit yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. would would have to come under the one of these sort of visa routes yeah I, Okay, great. So, and you see, you think this is where the growth is? In well, I think like it, it the... really plays to our strengths of, of you know, Good. of obviously con considerable expertise about advising early stage companies on how to establish and grow in the UK, particularly okay. raising finance. Then there's the layer onto that, the investment platform sort of expertise, the fact that it's then, it's then been approved As for use like by the Home Office. Stage, then they are so we're looking to sort of sell uh, technology and services Gosh, you're doing the whole supply to chain. Other, other, other countries around the world who what, have like the, similar visa immigration oh you know, the other platform similar, the, the visa platform as well well to, to other to, you know to other countries who are looking to do a similar sort of thing really because right. this is probably leading technology in the world really there's um, this great podcast that I've listened to thrice actually because <laughs> I wanted to be up to up to uh, <laughs> the job um, uh, from the FT which is why companies don't want to list in the UK anymore yeah and um, which in a nutshell says that in the aftermath of discovering that uh, uh, Robert Maxwell had um, uh, plowed the funds of a pension uh, funds of his companies his media conglomerates uh, in order to actually inflate the, the, the price of its stock uh, of its shares um, accounting rules change in the UK uh, around 10 years or 15 years ago and therefore that was one of the reasons why the UK stock exchange become, became much less attractive to, um, to companies and now a lot of them are just listing in the US, no, no, you're no questions asked. So how is that, do you think, how is that impacting your, your, your business because you are doing all the groundwork to prepare yeah. all these these I, seeds and then startups yeah. and then SMEs to, to get to scale and then when they are ready to do like the big thing and also rip off the benefit then bang they go and do a listing in the US and on the Nasdaq when the uh, no, when no what, the, what they tend to do is to you know they exit via trade sale rather than listings oh. so the reason why to, to private equity funds to, or to just uh, uh, other large corporates. Oh. So, so for example, oh, yeah, you know, uh, go back, you know, Chargemaster, Chargemaster, we're we're going to list, mm -hmm. 
and they were they were going through the whole broker exercise of listing. Um, they then had an offer on the table of 138 million or something. They decided to take that there and then sort of thing. I think the reality about <laughs> about listing who wouldn't? exactly who wouldn't. <laughs> the reality about listing is most private investors wouldn't take the uh, you know in a, if they saw a business plan and we talked about the exit is going to be by listing, they wouldn't take that seriously unless the founders of the company had had previous listing experience. Because it is a very complex area, uh, nobody quite knows how to do it. And obviously, if you list on AIM, you don't quite know whether that's going to be liquid, where you can sell your shares. Exactly. Whereas, that's exactly what it says in this podcast. Exactly. That, so, that, that, that basically, the companies which are listed in the UK at the moment are not very attractive, no, not sexy. No, it's like no. mining stuff, I, I mean, I would, insurance, I, I would, banking. I, but the excitement is in the My US. advice to all entrepreneurs starting businesses wouldn't be to necessarily look at you know, stock market listings, yeah. unless you can surround yourself with a chairman and a, and a non-executive team mm -hmm. who have listed. But uh, in, in, is it, this, is, this is definitely a route if you are, if oh, you no, start it, up is based it, in the US, in, well, in, you know, in the Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, I mean it, it, it certainly is a route, and obviously yeah, there are many Facebook examples of, yeah, no, they're yeah. phenomenal, but, exactly. but the more obvious and the more sort of viable route, and mm. the one that, if you're trying to secure money, on the basis of that's my potential exit that investors will believe the most is trade sales. Trade sales. Like acquisitions. Acquisitions. And acquisitions. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, that will give more comfort to when you're earlier stage. But clearly, if you know what you're doing, if you have listed before, you believe the business has the potential to list and it's a liquid sort of stock market where, you know, then your shareholders can sell, sell shares, then... Obviously, it, it makes sense. But actually, I, I must uh, thanks. It's 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 a it's an it's an interesting perspective because I must I must say what they say in this FT podcast. I've also noticed it in my uh, portfolio yeah. of, of shares, which all my shares based in the UK um, since I'd say three or four years ago of the COVID crisis, they're still not recovered. No, exactly. <laughs> and so I can't exactly. sell them because no, I'm exactly. doing a massive exactly. uh, a capital loss. But um, and, exactly. and it's still not recovering. So yeah. while shares which are listed, of course, in the US or are in continental Europe, are, have somehow much uh, uh, recovered much better. So um, yeah, it seems to be okay. Great. Well, that's that's all for my questions, really. Good. Well, we hopefully, it, hopefully, hopefully, the thoughts. readers, the listeners. The, vo the, the viewers, which there aren't any, have enjoyed the conversation, which has been thoroughly enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, likewise. As you might have guessed, I had a great time speaking with Scott. He is a very entertaining and also dynamic person uh, with a dry sense of humour, which is a typical British sense of humour, which I really like. So, this is it from us at Crefovi. Do leave a review or like us on um, YouTube, on uh, uh, various social media apps, uh, tweet about us, and um, uh, also, uh, you know, rate us on LinkedIn and stuff. And um, yeah, I'll see you at a next show or live webinar. It was a pleasure. Bye, everyone.